examens go okay. Yeah, you need to have that. We only have a couple. The real ones. What was it? Is it maths and um, just maths? Just maths. Just maths. Yeah. Um, okay. Fair enough. Right then, we've got we've got a few things to finish off um, from me before you get Neil for about I don't know six or eight weeks, I should think. We need to discuss electronic noise in circuits. Um, so this lecture is rather didactic, which means I stand and talk at you a lot and pleasantly manage to stay awake. And there isn't really any electronics in it as such, it's just concepts. Um, but the next lecture and the one after that are where all the actual meat lives. So the sort of exam questions that will turn up won't be about this stuff. Um, this is sort of groundwork, if you like. So we'll do some books and then we'll talk a bit about what noise is and where it comes from. And then we'll talk about some sources of noise that you find in electronic circuits. Um, and then we'll go on to, well, we won't derive, because there isn't really time for derivation. Um, we'll present some sort of interesting things that happen in noise that we might not expect. And if you want to know a bit more about it, it's in, in the program notes that I've handed out as well. And then the lecture after this, we'll talk about how you actually do calculations with noise. Um, so if you've got an op amp, you need to figure out how much noise voltage you can expect that it's output under certain conditions. Those calculations will come later. So if you are interested in doing a bit of reading, um, there's an excellent book by Martin Bakker and Connolly, which costs about 150 quid. Um, even my copy's illegal. There's, uh, I thought that would be a laugh. Um, there we go. <laughs> Well, you can find these things if you know where to look, and if you're unlucky, you'll only go to prison for a little bit. Um, there's another chap called Van der Zeel, who was writing books from the 50s to about the 80s. He <coughs> spent a lot of time worrying about flicker noise, which we'll talk about later. His books are pretty impenetrable. Um, it doesn't mean they're wrong, it just means they're not used to get along with, in my opinion. Leach was a uh, lecturer at Georgia Tech until about five years ago when he unfortunately died. Um, he had some notes called Noise Pop Pori. And if you can dig about on the internet, you might find a PDF for it. It used to be available, but somebody who was controlling his estate decided to sell the rights to that material to a publishing company, and it's now in book form. Well, it's only about $45, I think, and the exchange rate's not too bad at the minute, in sterling. Um, definitely worth having if you want a book about noise. If you compare the Briggs version, he wrote a paper um, 21 years ago. Really? Oh, yeah, I don't know. Um, in 1994, which contains the majority of what you want, but because it's a, a journal article, it's quite compressed. It assumes quite a lot of stuff already. And if you're not happy with those assumptions, you won't be able to get into the material. But you don't have to buy any of them. You can get everything you need from me. So what will we actually talk about in these three or four lectures? Some sources of noise and how we actually decide how much noise there is. It's not as straightforward as just measuring the voltage. And then we'll ask some questions about how much noise power is actually available. And we'll think about how we might combine noise sources because there's almost always more than one source of noise in a circuit. Every time you add a component, you put another source in, possibly two. So we'll need to know how to put them together to get an answer. And then we'll have a look at an RC circuit, and then we'll start talking about signal-to-noise ratio, and this is when we're getting some calculations towards the end where we look at some op-amps. I might put BJT in, might not. I think you ought to at least see it. Maybe I won't examine it. So nothing about FETs and noise, nothing about oscillators and noise, nothing about noise in microwave systems. That's to say above 300 megahertz, not the ones that get dinged, although they are above 300 megahertz. Biscuit for anybody who knows the frequency of a domestic microwave. Wow. <laughs> you know when John stands up here and goes, look, it's simple, and you all sit there going, yeah. mm -hmm. Now I'm sitting there going, how can you guys not have come across this in one, there's like 130 of you here maybe. Well, 115. Go look it up. Right, 
So maybe noise in BJTs, maybe not. Depends how long all this takes us. This isn't a complete set on noise. I spent four years working on noise, and I worked on something that isn't even in these slides. Something that you'll probably never come across in the end, unless you end up in a little bit of the field that I was working in. But this should be enough to get you through an entire career of engineering design. So it really is enough. <laughs> So there are several sorts of noise, and one of them is produced by human activity. You could call it man-made if you like. And this is radio signals that you accidentally pick up, um, EMI from machines, that's to say motors and generators and so forth. Poorly laid out power electronics. If you um, put your mobile phone next to a switch mode power supply that was perhaps a knockoff, you might, and then try and make a phone call, it may or may not work. That is often a case of the EMI from your power supply stops your phone from being able to transmit to the base station, or stops the phone here in the base station and transmits it to it. The layout circuit is actually quite important. A lot of the time, the things that stop circuits working are the fact that the designers bugged up the design, although sometimes that is true, <coughs> is that if you put things slightly too far apart, you will add a little inductance in the track. And if you put things slightly too close together that will not go too near each other, there will be a small parasitic capacitance between them. And all these things are there, even though they're not on your circuit diagram. And the thing you end up building isn't the thing you're expecting it to be. And then it doesn't work, and you wonder why. If you're not joining me for the MOSFET audio client for some insane reason, and you're doing the switch mode power converter instead, this will come and get up close to you because it affects the design of switch mode power supplies an awful lot. The other thing that can come and get you is humbug. Let's imagine I had uh, a box here with an output and ground. Doesn't matter what's in the box, some circuits. And I've got a box here with an input and a ground, and some circuits in the box. And I can keep going. If I hook all the grounds together, and then I hook both ends to the earth, there is a loop. And if I am unlucky in my design, a little current will flow in that loop, and it will put the sound of 50 hertz all over your system. The trick is to, to cut it somewhere. That is not to say, unwire the earth from the three pin plug, that is not the correct solution. It does work, but it has certain risks attached, uh, which you may be unlucky enough to find out if you ever try it. There are other ways of dealing with it. Humbling will tend to come and get you when you're not expecting it as well, much like EMI. And there are some regulators that say how much EMI things like mobile phones can produce and microwave ovens and that sort of thing. <coughs> Especially concerns of medical electronics. Some other sources of noise are those that are external, that's to say environmental noise like lightning strikes and high energy cosmic rays. They were the only two that I could think of. I don't know if you've uh, come across the TV program a while ago where somebody went around counting, counting lightning strikes. And they just stand somewhere and you can't see any lightning but the machine clicks and it's picking up the EMI. Very sensitive detector. The other source of noise, which is actually what we want to discuss, is the internal noise. This is noise that's generated inside the electronic components that are in our circuit. <coughs> this is the noise that we can't escape from. We can try to minimise it by a decent design, but it will always be there. And it's the hiss that you hear if you turn the guitar amp up to 11. The most final tap is fine. Um, or, and you don't play any, anything through it. And this comes from resistors and transistors and diodes. Usually we assume that capacitors and inductors are perfect, and a lot of the time they are. But every now and then, we have to think about them as well. But we won't discuss them here. So when we want to know how much noise there is, um, you could put a, an oscilloscope on it, and this is the noise of this, rather. This is noise of a 10 kilo ohm resistor measured on one of the old scopes out of the second year lab. 
um, in a bandwidth of probably about 60 megahertz with a 100 to 1 probe, which itself will add some noise, and the oscilloscope will add some noise. And it's about this much fuzz. It's not very easy to say what the value is. How can you be certain that this is as big as the setting we get? I only looked for a millisecond. It's not very helpful to think about the amplitude of the noise because it's difficult to say what the amplitude is definitely going to be. If you were to take the average of this, all the stuff above the middle and all the stuff below the middle would cancel out and leave you with nothing, which is the, uh, the interval over there. So you can't tell there's so many volts of noise because you don't have a decent way of saying over what time period and what bandwidth. It gets too complicated. The other thing that you'll find about noise is that if I were to try to trigger this scope, at the moment the trigger is just there, so this is free running. If you try and trigger it, it won't trigger. Because the scope needs a period in the waveform for it to trigger off, but this waveform doesn't have a period, it's random. It's random in the sense that if I know exactly what the value is here, it doesn't give me any idea about what's to come or what's been. <coughs> You can't work it out. It's not like a sine wave where you can say, oh, there's an equation that describes it and I just substitute it at a particular time and that will tell me the voltage. There is no expression for this. It's based in statistics. Happy with that idea? Right. I might say something else now. <coughs> I've only got red and green. Sorry. <coughs> if I write on this, will it come off? Yeah. Can anybody see that at all? No, I didn't think so. That any better? No. no. Right. You know a bell curve? Of course your distribution looks like that. The chances of finding a particular value in the noise are a bell curve drawn sideways. So it kind of looks like that. Like that. The farther I get from the middle, the less likely that is to be a particular noise at a certain time. It's most likely to be in the middle. That's called the amplitude distribution. And we'll talk about it again in a minute. So the average value is zero. That's to say, it's gone. Who did that? The average value on that last graph is zero. But that doesn't mean that you can't have noise that dissipates power. Noise can be transferred from one resistor into another, or from one off amp into a resistor. <coughs> Even if the resistor is just on a bench, and you plug another resistor and twist the wires together, there will be some thermal equilibrium eventually, because the noise will transfer power as a current through the resistors until they are equally hot. If I took a cigarette lighter and put it under one of the resistors, its noise would go up, we'll see that in a bit, and it would transfer noise power to the other resistor until they were the same temperature. There would also be conduction of heat through the copper wires, and that would probably be much more important than the noise power transfer. But noise is a way of getting thermal equilibrium in systems where we're worried about thermal energy. So power can be moved around, and the power that you can dissipate is proportional to the mean square. So I would square this. What happens if I square that? Oh, it's positive. Yeah, <laughs> you have a biscuit and somebody else back. Oh, oh, God. Oh. Right, um, I'll have to say prayers for that one later. Who, who had positive up here? Well, I'll leave those up there. And uh, don't eat them. So if everything goes up like that, and all these heights go up by the square of whatever that is. It's still random. We still don't know anything about the past or the future, based on the now. But everything's above the line. So if I took the mean of that, I'd get a non-zero answer. Integral over a long period of time. I'll get something that this little guy up here, somewhere around there, maybe. Can't really say for sure. So 
So if I'm prepared to worry about the mean square of the noise voltage, that's to say you square it and then take the average, I'll have a number which is proportional to how much noise there is. And it will be measured in volts squared, or if I worry about the noise current, amp squared. Now you can take the root of the squared mean, and you have the RMS, and that will be measured in volts because you have rooted your volts squared. Happy with those ideas? Lots of ideas stuffed in here, unfortunately. If you're not, say now, and I'll do it again. Onwards then. So, there is the question of how much time above some set level we might find the noise. I said there was an amplitude distribution where there was essentially a probability of finding some value in the shape of that probability distribution of course. It isn't always, by the way, but it just happens to be more seen for resistance. If I said, well, if I take the RMS, so I've squared it and mean it and then I've rooted it, I'll have some value. And this will be a value which is proportional to the amount of power that noise can, can sh shunt around the system. If I think, well, 50% of the time, the actual value right now, measured value of noise, which we don't know about the past and the future, we just happen to know the now, if that's only twice as big as that average value, we can give that a metric, that's to say a measurement. And that measurement is called a crest factor. And sometimes you'll read that, um, uh, yeah, you have to read about electronics. You have to read about electronics, that's what it says. Um, you will say, oh, 99.7% of the time, a crest factor of less than six. What that's really saying is that over a very long period of time, the chances of the noise exceeding so many times the RMS value is so it's less than so many percent. So the crest factor of six is really high because only 0.3% of the time will you find the noise above that. But that's just a guess. Well, it's not a guess. It's um, it's not certain that if you took a particular piece of time and did all the measurements you needed to do, you'd definitely get a press factor of six under those conditions. It's statistical and liable to change. Happy with the idea of press factor? If you like audio, um, especially old VU meters, that's to say needle meters, they have all sorts of specifications to do with press factor. Because they, if you buy an RMS, um, a true RMS meter, which is an even meter, the way they work that out is for a sine wave. If you put a triangle in, it will give you the wrong RMS value. But there is a fudge factor, which is to do with the crest factor. So it turns up in, um, in signals that we know about as well as signals that are random. The other thing we have to talk about noise is to say that it changes frequency sometimes. So not only is there this amplitude distribution, there is some change of frequency as well. Now if you have turned the guitar and guitar up to 11, the hiss that you hear contains all frequencies evenly. Not evenly in the mathematical sense, I mean equally. Up to the bandwidth limit of your amplifier, which will be approximately what? 20 kilohertz. You'd better send the biscuit back. I want to use one of those. I don't know if they've been. It's alright, I'll come and go. Yes, bandwidth of human hearing about 20 hertz to about 20 kilohertz. Although, I think mine's down to about 15 now. So it means that I can build a little device to emit 25 kilohertz and I can have it so that I've got a little camera and I've taught a Raspberry Pi the shape of a cat, a domestic cat, and I've stuck it in my vegetable patch, and when it sees cat, and it pro processes temperatures right for a cat, shapes right for a cat, it emits 25 kilohertz, scares the living daylights out of the cat, and stops them pooing on my marrows. <laughs> Honestly. 
You wouldn't believe it. That lion poo stuff doesn't work. Right. Actually, growing vegetables is extremely cathartic and stops you worrying about engineering sometimes. So, it changes with frequency. Um, if you open up the, these notes, there's a lovely little graph, but I couldn't fit it on the slide. We say that noise has a colour. And if the noise appears at all frequencies equally, frequencies equally, we'll call it white. Because like white light has red and green and blue and so forth in equal measure, so the white noise has all the frequencies represented equally. There is pink noise and red noise and blue noise and purple noise. And there is a little equation that determines what happens with frequency to give you the different colours. <coughs> this is not related to the amplitude distribution. This is entirely different. Grab the door, will you? To see what happens in terms of frequency, we need to worry about one hertz. A single unit of bang. And you could say, well, I can reduce one hertz to less than that. But one is very nice because it's the base of all our counting system. It makes everything else easy. So we'll worry about a single hertz. And if we do that, we'll have the power that the noise can give in a unit of bandwidth. And we will call that the spectral density. Spectrum as in the spectrum of frequencies, not as in Captain Scarlet. Now, you see that worked four four years ago, not now. Um, so we will end up with volts squared per hertz, or volts per root per, depending if we want to talk about mean squared or mean squared and then oh, RS, sorry. And usually this is how we describe the noise. So many nanovolts per root per. If the noise is constant, if I had a transistor, say, and I measured the noise at 10 kilohertz and I found it to be, I don't know, 8 nanovolts per root per, I might go to a lower frequency and find the noise is higher. If I did, I'd have to be worried about what was the contributing factor to this noise. So there are these different noises and they have different colours and they will change what happens to the noise at certain frequencies. Happy with the idea of spectral density? Definitely not. If you don't like the idea of spectral density, imagine you've got a first order filter uh, which is low pass. So for you it looks like this. And the cutoff is about here. More power up here than down here. If we were looking at spectral density, we just have to reduce everything to one hertz and say spectral density here bigger than spectral density here. The fact that we did it with a sine wave and that I produced a mode plot is neither here nor there. There's no magic involved just because the statistics everywhere now. So the actual question of how the noise is produced. I don't really want to get into what happens in terms of electrons because it's not really necessary and eventually you have to debate is there a quantum foam that causes all this bubbling or not. And it's really something for the physicists. For the engineering designer, which is you guys, you only really need to know how to deal with the noise. So the noise that's produced by a resistor, even if it's just on a bench on its own, no circuit, or if it's in a circuit as well, it's called johnson nyquist noise, and it's caused by the random shuffling of electrons as the current passes, the, as the... The electrons are shuffling because the temperature is not zero Kelvin, essentially. So this has a constant power spectral density, so I measure at 10 hertz and I get a value, and I measure at 10 megahertz and I get a value, they'll be the same. And we will usually model it with a the feminine source. That's to say, I have a source that doesn't really have a plus or a minus because the noise goes above and below the line as per the oscilloscope thing up the top. And its value is 4 times Boltzmann's constant 
times the temperature in Kelvin times the value of the resistance, all square rooted, raised to the minus half. And that's what units and volts per root per. And usually for a resistor we're thinking of somewhat less than a nanovolt per root per, but depends on its value obviously. So the bigger R is, the bigger the noise is. And the higher the temperature is, the bigger the noise is. And we put it in series with the resistance. So this will be our resistor, the same value as R, but this resistor doesn't have any noise attached. This is noise free, perfect. So to take the noise out of the resistor, we put a source of energy in the circuit which takes the value of the noise that the resistor gives. And then we keep the resistor there with the same value, so many kilo ohms, but we just imagine it doesn't have any noise. Happy with that? Some resistors don't have any noise. Only real resistors have noise. So the RBE in a transistor isn't real. It's an incremental resistance. It's there because of the slope of the base emitted junctions IC by IB by VBE characteristic. Same as any other diode. Because that's not a real resistance, it doesn't contribute any noise. It's a resistance that we made up to satisfy a model that we like because it allows us to do some calculations. Same goes for the earlier resistance, resistance from the collector to the emitter. That's not real either. It just models the slope of the lines and the output characteristic. But resistors you can actually pick up and hold up and say this is 10 kilograms. They've all got this noise. In fact, most of them have got a bit more than this. This is the theoretical amount. <coughs> the other main contributor of noise is shock noise. This is um, due to shot key, not shot lee. And it comes about because in a PN junction, there is a little moment where a certain electron is on one side of the barrier, the transition region, if you like, and then there is a short time later when it's on the other side. And then there's a short time later it recombines. And it recombines, an electromagnetic wave leaves the diode, and we think about it in terms of voltage and current in the circuit. We don't worry about the fact the waves are moving. Well, we do, but only when we have to worry about that sort of thing, microwave frequencies. From the most point, we say voltage and current. So the fact that the electron is momentarily on one side and then later on the other. There is no point where it transitions over a period of time. It's on one side and then it's on the other instantly later. This um, discontinuity, the quantization, means that this noise has a different distribution to the Gaussian noise. And that's to say amplitude distribution, by the way. And actually it's Poissonian. So we have a slightly different equation. That is the, the result of the fact that its amplitude is different, amplitude distribution is different, means slightly different equation. 2 times Q, or E if you prefer, 1.69 times 10 to the minus 19, times the DC current that flows in the diode, measured in amps per hertz, or if you prefer, in a certain bandwidth, delta F, just amps squared. And if you sort of square root this, you end up with amps. So if you know the bandwidth, you know exactly how much noise. And if you do know the bandwidth and you do the calculation, your answer is in RMS. So we use a normal source, we've got a noise source here and a dynamic resistance, which is the dynamic resistance of the diode, could be RBE if it's a transistor. Happy? Mm, barely happy. Last one of the noise sources is flicker noise. There is still quite a lot of debate as to why flicker noise exists. <coughs> it seems to turn up everywhere and there doesn't seem to be a lower frequency limit for it, which is quite curious. People have managed to measure flicker noise down to frequencies where a period would be a month. And it still seems to follow roughly the same rule. So 1 over f is this region here, 
This is an extra noise caused by a circuit process. This is the white noise, which is an area noise. So this would continue along here all the way off the screen. But this extra noise source has appeared to increase the noise at low frequency. <coughs> and its relationship with frequency, that's to say its frequency distribution, approximates to one over whatever the frequency is. So the noise you get diminishes as frequency increases, which is why the graph slope like that. I'm not going to give you any equations for it, you just have to know that it exists. If you want the equations, try it in the books. There is often a corner frequency specified. You buy an operational amplifier and look at the data sheet, which is of course the first thing you do when you buy any electronic component, isn't it? Mm. Imagine biscuits for all those people who agree with me. <coughs> this, this point here is a corner, and the way they define the corner is when the root of the mean squared noise, y noise, has gone up by 1.4 times, so oh, what's that? Somewhere up here, I should think. That's what they call the corner. And when you buy an op amp, it will tell you what the corner frequency is. And if you happen to be working in some situation where maybe you're looking at a biological process where 10 hertz is a pretty important frequency for you, you'll try and buy an op amp with a jolly low 1 over F <coughs> in order that 10 hertz doesn't suffer 1 over, S, 1 over F noise. On the other hand, if you're operating at a couple of megahertz, you might not care at all. Generally speaking, it seems to be process dependent. That's to say, as we've got better at making silicon devices, 1 over F noise seems to have gone down. So we think it's a processing thing. But 1 over F noise turns up all over the shop. Some people believe the rotation of the Earth is subject to 1 over F noise and that every day is a slightly different length. I haven't seen any evidence for this. Pretty sure when I wake up it's light, when I go to bed it's dark. But it may be that it's fundamental to the universe. <coughs> or it may be that it just turns up in electronics. So there's a few things about noise which might surprise you. And I'm not going to examine these, but we do need to think about them because they inform how we design circuits sometimes. If I said to you, find the maximum power that can be transferred from a noisy resistor to a noise-free resistor, and by the way, what's the best value for R? You might think the answer would involve the size of the noise <coughs> resistor, the value of its resistance. Actually, it turns out that it doesn't. If you were in 118, or if you've watched the videos, you'll know that um, RS equals to R gives you the maximum <coughs> power transferred between RS and R. If we then did the voltage across, across R, it would be the noise source, and then just a potential divider of RS and R. So we'd end up with, assuming we take our maximum power transfer condition, the NS upon 2 for the voltage across, across R. And then we'd say, well, P is V squared upon R. So we'll have mean squared noise upon RS. And because we've got a 2 and we squared it, we've got a 4. So then we sub in the Johnson noise formula for KTR upon 4 times R, which is on the bottom. Everything goes except the KT. So the maximum amount of noise power you can get out of a resistor into the circuit that surrounds it is KT. Doesn't matter about the size of the resistor. Is that interesting? Now you can be honest, I know you're not interested in it. But it is surprising. You'd think bigger resistor, more noise. It doesn't work like that. Bigger temperature, more noise. So the power is independent of RS. Next time we meet, we'll have to combine some noise sources together. And we, unfortunately, can't just add them up. 
like you can with two voltages, you do superposition, just add up the values. Noise sources are a bit different because the, the statistics that we use to describe the noise get in the way. You don't have to learn this, but I thought you might like to see it. Was I mistaken? <laughs> right, so we've got a mean squared noise here, which is the combination, notice I didn't say sum, of this noise source and this noise source, whose values with time are Vn1 and Vnt, Vn2, and whose mean squared values are Vn2 squared bar and Vn1 squared bar, the bar being the mean. So Vn3 squared bar at the top is equal to the mean square of the time bit. And that's equal to the sum of these two squared and their mean. Try with some numbers if you don't believe. And if you expand this bracket, you get this bit, where you've got Vn1 squared, Vn2 squared, and V times Vn1 times Vn2. So this is just expanding the polynomial. No magic involved. Now, that and that are equal. This is the time dependent bit. This is the mean squared bit. So if I mean square this, I get that. I can drop the t because it doesn't matter what the time is anymore. I've got a number that represents the noise without worrying about time. So that and that are equal, and that and that are equal. And then the other thing we have to worry about is if they're correlated or not. How's the signals and systems going? Or whatever they're calling it now. Communication electronics. <coughs> well, badly. Autocorrelation, cross-correlation. No? No, I'm not. I don't know if it's in the course or not. It doesn't really matter. Two signals are uncorrelated if their value doesn't depend on each other at all. Signals become correlated when their values depend on each other. If they were completely correlated, you'd be able to work out one value if you knew the other. But we almost always deal with uncorrelated sources. In fact, the only time I can think of coming across correlated noise sources is the flipper noise in a transistor's base emitter is partially correlated to its shock noise. Um, and there's a fudge factor that we use to, to describe that. But you don't need to know that. Just assume all noise sources are uncorrelated. So if they're uncorrelated, it means we can say that the, uh, the mean of these two is equal to the mean of this one times the mean of that one. If they weren't correlated, that would be breaking some algebraic rules. A consequence of this is that Vn1 t and Vn2 t are zero if you mean them. If I go back up to this one, I took the mean of that, it would all drop to zero. As a consequence, that times that mean also zero. Which means this middle, this middle bit, which is simply that times two, disappears because two times nothing is nothing. And that will match our life. So <coughs> this middle term means that uh, Vn3 is that bit plus that bit, and this bit goes away. That's all that this is trying to show. So the important thing here is this bit. And what it says is, if you want to combine noise sources, you have to square them, mean them, and then add them. And if you want to group the answer, that's fine. But you can't just add them up, and then square that and root it home for the best, because it doesn't work. So, combining noise sources, square, mean, add. Now, keep going a bit. Something else that's interesting, my definition again, is what happens if you put a capacitor, or if you, you can call it first order circuit if you like, or you can say put a capacitor across a noisy resistor. Same thing. Well, Vn is the thermal noise of the resistor, and the mean square is the output is independent of the value of the resistance. We went over that one just now. All real resistors have a certain amount of capacitance. It's about a pinnacle for a, a little resistor that you might find in stores. So all real resistors are actually look a bit more like this. That. 
if we only worry about the capacitor and pretend the resistor isn't there, we can imagine this capacitor has a, a resistance in parallel with it, which is infinite in value. You can't put any DC current through a capacitor. Well, you can charge up the capacitor, but no current will flow continuously through it. So, an infinite parallel resistance. In which case, you end up with KT upon C, mean squared noise, from a capacitor. In the handout, this handout, this handout, that KT upon C is derived. But I took one look at it and thought, no, they won't want to do that. So if you really, really want to follow it, please feel free. But it's not necessary to know it. The only thing you really need to remember is output noise from a capacitor in a system, KT upon C. The KT upon C is to do with the resistor. If I make the resistor temperature go up, the T that I put in is the temperature of the resistor. Now I put this 100 degrees C, this is 0 degrees C, this expression, uh, 393 Kelvin needs to go in there, not the capacitor temperature. Last one. This question of temperature is actually quite important. If I was uh, designing a satellite downlink for, um, I don't know, let's imagine I'm going to take over the world with a system of satellites covering the lasers. Sounds like how I might do on the weekend. Um, if I wanted to, sorry, if I wanted to communicate with those satellites, I would probably want a sky dish for the ship. The person who designs the sky dish front end bit, not the dish shape, although that's very important too, um, the actual electronics in that little box. They'll call it a low noise block or a low noise amplifier, and it will have its noise, total noise, defined in terms of the temperature above Kelvin. And this, the idea of noise temperature is quite important. The reason they'll do that is the output impedance from that amplifier will be 75 ohms for a sky or a virgin system or whatever. TV generally 75 ohms, Z0. <coughs> so they'll say, if I had a 75 ohm resistor at 500 Kelvin, it would give the same noise as your low noise amplifier. Well, it wouldn't be a very low noise amplifier then, but that's beside the point. So we can fudge the temperature and give a certain characteristic impedance. And if you're dealing with transmission lines, high frequency systems, sometimes that's really useful. Now that's essentially what I've said here. You can have an effective temperature, not the real temperature, a temperature above the real temperature that gives you the noise you've actually got from the particular resistor and some extra noise which is coming in from elsewhere that you want to sort of bundle in together. And when you buy your low noise amplifier, there's a good chance that it'll have a couple of metrics and one of these will be its noise temperature. Happy with the idea of noise temperature? Desperately unhappy already. Right, there is a review, but much more than one is a bad. Next time we will be doing circuits and calculations and the proper stuff that we're all used to do.